welcome to the Cinnabar. Now today, we're gonna to bring you a different kind of an episode. You see, we're gonna tell you today how we got into serious hot water here on the Cinnabar. You see, right here in this spot about 50 years ago, our granddad was drilling with an old cable tool drilling rig, looking for irrigation water for our alfalfa fields out here. And he did find plenty of water, but he found more than he bargained for him because the water here comes out of the ground at about 240 degrees Fahrenheit. So it created some real opportunities, but it also created some real challenges. So today we're gonna to show you this whole system. It's been added to, we've got some more, more uh, wells drilled now. We're still primarily using it for, for irrigation water, but there's been some things added to the system since then. And we'll talk about this whole geothermal resource that sits under our feet here. Now about 10 years ago, our local power company wanted to come in and develop this resource to produce electricity. So they drilled a couple of more wells in addition to Granddad's old original well. And this was the first one they drilled. Now this one we're not using right now because we just don't, don't need the, the water volume at this point in time. But there's a reason it was drilled right in this location. And the reason Granddad hit that, that hot water over there. If, as you can see, we're in a, a, in a basin area here. In fact, this is an old lake bed from, from after the last ice age. This was a, this whole area was a huge lake bed. And then we've got the mountain range up between us, or about behind us. And right where these two meet, there's a major fault system. So when this was a lake, uh, the weight of the water was pushing this basin down. The range front over here was raising up. And so we've got this fault system that runs almost vertical. It's, a, it, it, it's about, oh, 80, 85 degrees I mean it's just almost straight up and down and that fault system of course created a conduit for this hot water to come percolating up through that fault and be right here on this range front so this well is, is piped all the way down to our geothermal power plant that we'll get to here in a, here in a minute and then on beyond another mile or little over a mile down that way where it's re when it when the power plant's running it's re-injected into the ground so that it can can recharge the aquifer and has time to heat back up before it come, makes its way back up here it's kind of a fascinating system <laughs> now we're just getting ahead of ourselves we'll get back to him shortly okay so let's take a little closer look at this water being pumped into the cooling pond here Mother Nature can be a little awe-inspiring. This is about like Old Faithful erupting on a constant basis. Now this is just with one well running. And you might be able to see through the mist on the far end of the pond down there, there's another pipe with some water coming in and that's coming off of the river, some cool water, trying to mix that in and let it settle in this, this big pond here to cool off because we can't possibly pump this hot water right out to the alfalfa. It would just kill all the plants immediately. Now with the pumps turned off, we can see a pretty interesting phenomenon that happens out at the end of this pipeline. If you look down at these rocks that we've placed out in front of the pipeline to keep from digging up the bottom of the pond so much, you can see there's a heavy layer of crystal coating these rocks. And indeed, even the, the end of the pipeline is just coated with a thick layer of crystal. So in this case, the crystals that are deposited here are called calcite or a form of calcium carbonate. Now what happens is, is this hot water when it's underground dissolves a lot of different types of minerals and puts them into the water solution, makes what we call a geothermal brine. And as the water cools and 
the pressure drops, then these minerals precipitate out, become solid again, and are deposited. Now, in this case, it happens very rapidly right here at this the mouth of this pipeline. Um, obviously, we're, we're dropping the pressure, the, the temperature's dropping rapidly, and we get an instant precipitation of these minerals out. Now, in, in nature, this happens oh, slowly over a course of millennia. As, as the waters c come up through the ground at a certain point, the temperature and the pressure drops enough that different minerals precipitate out at different levels, temperatures and, and pressures. And that's how we get these veins of minerals. Now, in the case of like quartz, that happens at about 300 feet underground on average. And at that same level, if there's any gold, then it precipitates out at, the, at about the same level that quartz does. And that's why we find in, in gold bearing areas that our gold is in, in, uh, included in that, that quartz matrix. Now, even our, our cinnabar that we were our namesake mineral here comes up through this hot water and cinnabar even though it's a, a mercury ore is is just a, another form of crystal it's a beautiful um, dark red crystal and while it contains mercury the the mercury is locked up in that matrix and it's relatively inert so this is this is kind of a a, a fascinating result of this hot water now let's see if we can chip a little bit out of this this uh, pipe here yeah, it comes off in layers, and we see some different different colors in there, and that's probably rust out of this pipe. Probably going to have to replace this. Now we've got some that, that looks very translucent in here. We've got some darker stuff, and that's how, kind of how nature is, too. When we see find these, these veins of quartz and calcite, some of it's translucent, some of it is what, what they call like a sugar quartz, where it's this whiter color that we see on the outside. Unfortunately, we don't have gold in this water, or we'd be we'd be crushing and panning this stuff out, trying to trying to extract that gold. Now, this is the third production well here, and it's the one that's pumping right now. That water that you see going into the ponds coming from this well and piped all the way back up over to the mountainside where it goes into that that uh, cooling pond. This one is capable of producing about. 2300 gallons a minute although it's throttled back right now to about 1700 gallons a minute it flows at 242 degrees now these three production wells are very very shallow for geothermal wells they average about 1200 feet in depth typical geothermal resources are found at much greater depths and the water here is much much cleaner than most geothermal water and I think that's because it's closer to the surface where it's not down so low and, and picking up so much mineralization now behind me is a three megawatt electric generation facility utilizing this hot water to produce electricity. It was built about 10 years ago by our local power company and unfortunately at this time it's in mothballs due to market conditions and some regulatory issues and it's really unfortunate because geothermal energy is, is really one of the most efficient and least impactful of the, on the environment of all sources of electricity. So we're really disappointed that this one isn't in operation right now. This, this system works on, on what they call a binary system. Rather than the, the hot water or steam that it generates turning a turbine itself, it actually goes in through a heat exchanger up in these, this pipeline system that actually heats a, a secondary fluid that, that flashes to steam at a lower temperature, about 160 degrees, and that's what, what turns the turbine. And of course, it's much cleaner. This hot water is, is uh, corrosive enough that it would eat up the turbines really rather quickly. So the water goes through here at about 240 degrees. The, the heat is pulled out of it and, and turning that turbine, and then the water goes back into the pipeline, and when we're irrigating, some of it goes up for irrigation. The rest of it gets re-injected in a well that's another mile or so in, in, the direction, in that direction out to the east. Well, let's go take a look at that. Now this is the end of the line. <laughs> pipeline, that is. Now you see that pipeline comes down off of the hill here and right into this building over here. And in this building is the, the re-injection well. And that well is about 2,700 feet deep. Now, this is about a mile and a quarter, maybe mile and a half 
from where granddad drilled that first well over against the mountain over there. And it has to be quite a ways from those production wells because we don't want to, to pump that cooled off water too close to those wells and short circuit the, the system. So this is really a closed loop system. We're re-injecting that, that water that's, that's had a bunch of the heat taken out of it back into the aquifer and then letting it recharge the aquifer, reheat, go back uh, up into the, the uh, reservoir underneath those wells, be pumped again, and right back down here. And of course we pull some off during the irrigation season, which is a pretty short season here because we're such high elevation. So we don't use a whole lot of that water as, as a percentage. Now because of our abundant water and extremely rich, fertile lake bed soil here, we grow some of the highest quality alfalfa in the world right here on the Cinnabar. This is the result. Now there's another byproduct to the hot water and alfalfa operation here, and that's wildlife. Now you might look way off in the distance, there's an overhead loop in the pipeline there and a few kind of scraggly poplar trees. Just this side of it, there's a little herd of mule deer feeding out there. And we typically have quite a few mule deer here in the fields. Uh, we have at times a very large herd of pronghorn antelope and occasionally a bighorn sheep or two will come down off of the mountain and water. So let's see if we can't sneak up and get a little closer to look at those muleys over there. See if maybe there's some antlers in the bunch. As we can see, they're none too concerned with us. Does have all seen me, but this little buck over here, he's still just happily eating away. See how close we can get for you. Figures it out. He's not a bad buck. Looks like a three-point. If you go by our western standards out here, there he spotted us finally. Must have heard us talking about him. Obviously these deer stay in awfully good shape and are awfully well fed. We're at about Probably 45, 50 yards, even bow hunting range. We've been watching him here for five or ten minutes now. He's still just kind of checking us out. He's not a trophy, but he put venison on the table for sure. <laughs> Unconcerned, we're gonna go back to eating. Now we don't hunt these alfalfa fields. As you can see, it wouldn't hardly be sporting. It wouldn't take much more skill than walking out in the field and shooting an old cow, and just about as exciting. So we save it for youngsters who are learning to hunt or old timers who really can't get out and traipse up and down the hills like they used to. Works out pretty good. And then we go hunt up on the main part of the ranch where it uh, takes a little skill and maybe even have to be in a little better shape. So we went from granddad's accidental discovery of that hot water, kind of a Jed clamp up moment, to producing enough electricity to power 3,000 homes and produce some of the finest alfalfa grown anywhere in the world. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I've found this whole process fascinating from the get-go. Thanks for joining us today. Until next time, happy trails from the Cinnabar.